Hi, my name is Linda Tillman, and I am uh, a master beekeeper, and I'm the president of the George Beekeepers Association at this point in 2020. Um, and I've been keeping bees since 2006, and I have made every mistake in the book. So I wanted to give a little view of how to avoid rookie mistakes in beekeeping, because Lord knows I've done all of them and probably 800 more. Um, and during the time I've been beekeeping, I've kept a blog, which is beekeeperlinda.com, where I've kept a record of all my mistakes. So you're welcome to go and look at that. So the first mistake that, I've, that I'm aware of, that I've made, was when I got my first nuke. And when you get a nuke or a package installation, you put the bees in, and this is what it looks like. They're all in the box, you think. But then you look over in the nuke box that they came in or in the package that you dumped into the hive, and there are still bees left in the box, in the original packaging. And I was panicked over what in the world am I going to do? How do I get those bees into the hive? What about those bees that are still in the package? Are the bees that are still in the nuke box? So I was a new beekeeper and I had a list of 10 Metro Atlanta beekeepers that I had a list of several longer than that, but I called 10 and finally found one woman who told me what to do. And what she said was that all the bees ultimately want to be with their mama. And so what you do when you install the hive is you then set the nuke box in front of it on its side like this so it doesn't feel like a hive to the bees and they will go into the hive to be with their mama. It might take them a little while but they do do it. And here's a top bar that I, I had years ago. It's not the one I'm using now. It has an entry here and has an entry right up here. And so I set the package down right here with still bees in it after I dumped them into the top bar waiting for them to move in with mama and you know a package is a great thing for a top bar because you don't you don't have um you have top bars for frames and so if you install you can't install a nuke in a top bar so it's great to get a package or a swarm for a top bar hive so the second problem that people um run into is starting with only one hive it's really important to have two hives for lots and lots of reasons. One of the really important reasons is to have a, a hive for comparison. So if something's going on in this hive, you can check in this hive and see if the same thing's going on and know that that's about what's supposed to be happening at this time of year. Or if you see a problem in this hive and don't see it over here, you'll know you have a problem and you need to call somebody. So um, if hives are started at more or less the same time, the amount of brood they're producing and the amount of um, nectar that they're bringing in is, is usually fairly similar. The other reason to have two hives is to have a resource. It's very good to have, if this hive went queenless, then I could get a frame of eggs uh, from this hive and put it in there. And Michael Bush says you can add a frame of brood and eggs, whoops, you can add a frame of brood and eggs once a week and it will be fine. So let's see, when I got, why I have this hive is that this hive, well, I, had, I had a swarm box, uh, swarm trap box sitting on a pile of logs in the back of my house and I had gotten rid of all my bees this year because before the coronavirus my plan was to move. So I was planning to um, sell my house and leave and I had moved all my bees which wasn't a lot because I'd been waiting to move. I moved my bees to my daughter's house um, to live there and so I didn't have any bees in my yard and I had a, um, sorry, <clears throat> I had a um, I had a, uh, the box just sit, had the swarm box from Steve Page just sitting in my backyard on top of a pile of logs, kind of cattywampus at an angle. And one day I got a call to go get a swarm in Inman Park. So I went and called the swarm and I put it in a beehive that I had in a community garden so that it would be a good teaching hive. And when I came home that day, I went down to the backyard to get another piece of equipment to take to the hive in the garden. And there was this hive, this swarm had moved in to the Steve Page hive just sitting on the pile of logs. So wow, I put this first hive box right here up here to, um, to house that hive. And, and I waited a day or two and then I noticed in the swarm down in the base, down the, on top of the logs that there were no uh, bees flying in with pollen on their legs. And I watched for about a week and there were never any bees with pollen on their legs. And I thought, well, maybe the swarm was a, virgin swarm. I mean, the queen, it was a secondary swarm and the queen was a virgin. And so what I would need to do is wait a little bit till she had sort of proved herself before I disrupted the hive by moving it upstairs. So meanwhile, I came to this hive and I put swarm lure on it. And I have a great recipe for swarm lure on my blog that came from a guy in Italy. And he told me to take a, a one inch cube of beeswax and melt it in a fourth a cup of olive oil. And when it's melted, stir in 
20 drops of lemongrass oil, and that makes a kind of smeary lotion kind of thing, and you smear it around the inner cover, uh, the opening in the inner cover, and you smear it under the top of the uh, entry to the hive, and maybe on the top of a couple of frames, and inevitably it works. So while I was waiting for the swarm in the backyard to prove itself, a huge swarm moved in this side. It looked like a tornado of bees. It was such a huge swarm that my neighbor next door came over and said, Linda, you cannot have bees in your front yard. And I said, Steve, wait about 15 minutes and they'll all move into the hive and it'll be okay. And sure enough, in 15 minutes, it was all over. And now he comes over to brag on the fact that I have bees in his yard whenever he has, I mean, in my yard, whenever uh, he has visitors. So after I've got a swarm that has moved into this hive I intended for the swarm in the backyard, I had to put a second hive up here to um, house the swarm. And by the time they were flying in with pollen on their legs, I moved them up here. Um, and now I have three hives in the front yard. This is what it looks like. Let's see if I can get to that <clears throat> slide. This is what my front yard looks like now. Now this swarm, which came with a proven queen, it was a huge swarm, a tornado of bees, was ready to go to work right away. So they have a whole lot more honey collection going on than this hive which is the swarm that moved into the backyard with an unproven queen. And so it took them a little bit longer to develop their resources. And so they only have one super on them. And this little hive is a, um, a hive that came from a three frame um, queen castle that a friend started for me with a survivor queen. So I'm hoping it'll do fine, but it's a tiny hive and it, it won't be producing honey this year. I'll probably need to feed it for the end of the year. Okay, another um, mistake rookies make is failing to light the smoker. It's really hard to light a smoker. I've been doing bees now for a long time and I'm terrible at lighting the smoker. But this is P.N. Williams. He's the man that I got my first hive from, her first two hives from. And he, um, this is a smoking contest, smoker contest that took place at his bee club, the Terra Bee Club in Georgia. And he showed me how to do it. So you take a little golf ball size, uh, a little roll of pine straw and light it and put it down in the bottom of the smoker and give it lots of pumping so that it, it uh, lights up. And then you add little bits of pine straw, little balls of pine straw until the smoker is as packed as you can get it to last the amount of time that you think you're gonna be inspecting. So at this smoker contest, a whole bunch of people lit their smokers and they got them all well lit and PN packed in almost that whole pile of pine straw that you see with him. He packed in almost all of that into his smoker. And then we all left the smokers on their own and went and had a picnic for two hours. And when we came back at the end of the two hours, Guess whose smoker was still lit? PN's, and so he won the contest, which was really fabulous, and I was really impressed. But the reason you wanna make sure you always have a smoker lit is you never know. That might be the day you open the hive and the queen has died, you didn't know it, and the bees are really mad. Or you drop a frame by accident and the bees are really mad. Or for some other reason, you kill a bee in the process and the bees are really mad, but you need to have a smoker available to you. I mostly don't use my smoker a lot. I use my smoker to knock at the door. So I will go knock, knock at the front door. And, uh, and then I know that, um, that I'm letting the bees know that I'm here. But the way I minimize my smoker use is by using what's called half drapes. And I learned about this from Billy Davis, who was a wonderful beekeeper in Virginia. And what hive drapes are, are a way to cover the hive, sort of like a surgeon would do. So you cover the hive with the, the hive drape and leave exposed the frame that you're gonna look at. And ideally I'd have another hive drape on the other side covering up this one other frame. Um, and when you have a box that's off of the hive uh, waiting for you to look at it, cover it with a hive drape as well. And these hive drapes keep the bees so calm, they don't feel nearly as exposed and afraid as they do when, um, when you take the top off and just there's the box open to the sun where it's been in the dark for such a long time. Now Billy Davis used oil cloth for his hive drapes, but I haven't invested in oil cloth and these are flower sacking towels that come from Walmart and they're very tightly woven. They're, they're, it's flower sacking, it's material that's woven tightly to keep the flower in the back. So um, these are cheap and I get them at Walmart and, and a pillowcase will work as well too. You can use a, um, a pillowcase exactly fits an eight frame box. They're just perfect. and um, Billy Davis told me that he was, um, he thought I should be using oil cloth and not pillowcases. And I told him I use 800 thread count pillowcases. My bees are in the lap of luxury. Another mistake people make is opening the hive too frequently. P.N. Williams, who I got my first hives from, always said you should have two hives, one to open a lot and kill and the other to have survive. But really you should have two hives for the reasons I said earlier. But if you open your hive too frequently, 
the bees are not going to have a chance to regroup and keep going. And every time you open your hive, you have a chance of killing the queen. So you want to keep your hive um, as uninterfered with as you can do it and still be a good beekeeper. So always have a reason to do your hive inspection. And you should, at this time of year in the summer, you should be um, checking on your hive about once a week because of the nectar flow that's going on and all of that. But once you've met the reason for your inspection, you can quit. So when you've answered the question, end the inspection. If what you're going in the hive for is to see, do they need you to add another honey super? You can tell that from the top box and you don't need to go all the way down into the hive. You shouldn't have to go down and look at every frame every time. Sometimes you wanna know, is the queen laying? So you might not, you might go down into the box enough to see either the queen or see evidence of the queen. You, you can see eggs and that's enough. I, I didn't see the queen for the first three years I was a beekeeper. You don't have to look at every frame every time. And at this time of year, the, I'm making this, uh, recording this talk in May. At this time of year, um, the main questions are usually, do I need to add another box and is the queen laying? But sometimes you might have other questions as you go, on into the summer, you'll want to know, do the bees need, bees need feeding? And you'll want to know, do I have any kind of problems with the hive? Are there too many small hive beetles? Do the bees look unhealthy? That kind of thing. So always start with two hives, one to thrive and one to kill with overlooking, overdoing. <clears throat> Another um, problem that rookies run into is not having enough equipment at the ready. I think this picture was from my second year of beekeeping and the reason I think that is since my second year of beekeeping I've used all medium boxes and you can see that this hive is all medium boxes. This one still has a deep um, because it's probably my first hive and came on deeps. So I had this extra deep sitting around which would have been on this hive if I kept using deeps. Um, one day I drove up into my carport and there was a swarm had moved into a nuke box I had seen there. I've actually had pretty good luck with that, with swarms finding me. They seem to inevitably find me and the Italian swarm lure helps a lot. But I didn't have the equipment for the swarm and it's just sitting in this nuke box and it needed a place to live. So what I had to do while I waited for my equipment is I had to, I didn't have a half cover, so I used this cheap piece of plywood we put on the top. And of course that's too light and is not fitting on the hive and so there's no reason it won't just blow off in a rainstorm. So I have a flower pot on the top of it to weigh it down. I don't have any cinder blocks yet. So I put it on an old hive stand that I had. So it's just waiting there until I can get the right equipment. And it's really much better to have equipment ahead. And especially in, during the nectar flow, it's important to have a lot of empty supers because in a very short time, your hive can go from this to this. And that, I mean, that is a lot of honey supers that have been put on that hive all in a very short period of time. Another rookie mistake is feeding the bees when the bees don't need it. Thankfully, this doesn't happen at my bee club anymore, but for years and years and years, literally every meeting ended with whoever was running the meeting saying, now remember when you go home, feed your bees. Well, you should not feed your bees at the slightest drop of a hat or just because somebody tells you to. You should feed your bees when they need it. And you can start testing your hive from the very beginning by raising up the back of the hive and feeling how heavy it is, or literally weigh it. There are some scales you can build or buy that help you know how heavy your hive is. Um, but feeding the bees when the bees don't need it is really a, not a good thing for the bees. So you should only feed them when they do need it and certainly shouldn't be feeding them now. This picture is taken in June. And those are Boardman feeders, which feeders on the outside of the hive are usually, once the nectar flow is over, um, or an invitation to, to robbers. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to have hives on, I mean, uh, feeders on the outside of your hives. And this is actually not true because these are my hives at the community garden and I'm not feeding them. There are boardman feeders on the outside of the hive, but it's because these hives are located right opposite um, a, a house where there's a swimming pool and the bees love the swimming pool. So the um, boys who live there asked me if I would mind doing something to try to keep the bees at home. So I, that, that summer and every summer since, have put uh, uh, Boardman feeders on the outside of the hives with chlorinated water in them. And the bees have quit bothering the guys next door. Now this year I don't have any Boardman feeders on the hive and I hadn't heard from the boys yet, but it isn't, um, it isn't hot enough to go swimming yet either. So we'll see, I may have to do that yet. 
Now, it's a re like I said a minute ago, it's a really bad idea to feed externally during the dearth. And what the dearth is, is when the nectar flow is over. And in Atlanta, where I am, the nectar flow is over at the end of the tulip poplar bloom, which is just in a week or two. And so at the beginning of June, the nectar flow is over. And then you, you can't feed the bees outside. I wouldn't feed them during the nectar flow anyway. They don't need feeding then. But feeding externally when they might need feeding during the dearth, is really a bad idea. So this is not mine. This is a hive that Julia and I had at the um, Blue Heron Nature Preserve. And this is a top bar, uh, hive top feeder. I'm sorry, hive top feeder. And that little area in there is where the bees come up from the hive through those openings and drink the fluid, the sugar syrup that's in the hive top feeder through the screen wire. That's one way you can feed bees inside the hive. Another way, this is a Boardman feeder, but it's being put inside the hive with a, an empty box surrounding it. And that sometimes works. And then this, uh, to the right of it, is a baggie feeder. And a baggie feeder is just a Ziploc bag with sugar syrup on the inside. And you take a knife and cut three little slits in here. And the bees crawl up and walk on top of the Ziploc and suck the nectar through the little slits. But my favorite kind of feeder, and it's the only one I've ever used where I haven't ever had a bee die, is called a rapid feeder. And it looks like an angel food cake pan, and it has um, a tube in the middle, and that's a plastic cup that's removable that sits over the top of the tube. And as you're pouring the syrup in, the bees can come up through, they know that there's syrup, they smell it, and they come up through the center of the cone, and they go down to, they can crawl down these sides, which have um, um, ridges on them so that it's easy for them to get a grip and they start drinking the syrup even as I'm pouring it in. And, and you can see them having to move up as the syrup gets higher and then the syrup gets really high and you put the top on, this is the top. But I didn't put the top on in the picture so you could see the whole thing. And if you're wondering what I'm feeding them, I'm feeding them something called bee tea. And this has been used since the 1840s and is a recipe that came out of Germany from a guy named Steiner, I believe. I got the recipe from Ross Conrad and it has, it's sugar syrup for sure, but it also has chamomile tea and thyme in it. And to keep it from crystallizing, you put um, a little, I put sugar, I mean, a little bit of salt and a squeeze of lemon, and that keeps it from crystallizing, um, which you don't want to happen with sugar syrup inside your hive. Now, another important thing that beekeepers need to remember when they're starting out is to respect bee space. And what that means is that the bees are gonna fill up any space that is not bee space, which is the amount of space between um, the frames in your hive. Uh, and they need that space to move around in, but any other empty space, they're gonna fill with honeycomb. So this is a huge mistake I made. These were some hives in South Georgia, and we put um, a baggy feeder on top of the frames, just like that, and then put the uh, inner cover up here and then the top of the hive. When we got back 10 days later and opened the hive and lifted the inner cover off, there was bee, I don't have a picture of it because I was so embarrassed. There was honeycomb uh, draping down from the top all through the inner cover, and it was just a huge, huge mess for us. And um, I'm, I regret it forever. So if you're ever gonna baggy feed like that, do it either so that you completely cover the bars and there's not room for the bees to build comb, or put it on the top of the inner cover, which is better. Here's another uh, um, thing that happened when we didn't respect bee space. We were uh, raising hives at the Blue Heron Nature Preserve in Atlanta, and one of the hives went queenless, and they were hives that had been given to the Metro Atlanta, and they had a deep frame uh, on the bottom, so they had a deep box on the bottom, and all the rest of the boxes were medium, and I only use medium boxes. So we go into the hive, and there's no queen, and we have no other resources there. There's no way to to uh, put a new, put a frame of brood and eggs in from another hive with a deep, because none of the hives except this one had a deep uh, frame. So I went home and got a medium frame, oops, I went home and got a medium frame, and put it in that hive, and of course the bees filled the space with wax that was left because that's what they do. And you'll see on here a lot of drone comb, and uh, bees that are on foundation, which these bees were, are desperate for a place to build drone comb, and they often will do it between the frames, or they'll do it on the very edges of the frames where they can make a bigger cell for the drone. And so if you give them space to build their own comb and they haven't had that before, what they'll do is build drone comb because they're so desperate for the space. But you have to respect bee space. Here's another example of not respecting bee space. Actually, this is a, oops, this is an example of two big mistakes, huge. The first one is that the bee, this is, this is at Spark Elementary School where I'm the beekeeper. 
it's an Atlanta, Atlanta public school, and they allow a beekeeper to be there, which I think is just remarkable. We have two beehives on the roof of the school in the rooftop garden. And the beekeeper ahead of me was a man who went off to um, Afghanistan, I think. And when he did, he wanted to sample his honey. He gave the beehives to me gladly, but he wanted to sample his honey. So he took a frame out, right? You can see the space under here. He took a frame out right here and he uh, forgot to replace the frame or didn't have one to replace it. And this is a queen excluder. So when I came to look at the hive, they had built honey straight off of the queen excluder because they have the space and that's what they do with space. They build honeycomb. And the worst part of this, that that's a pretty big mistake because what are you gonna do with that? But the worst part of this is that I don't use queen excluders. I, ha I, can, I have three good uses for the queen excluder. One is that it's good for being a queen includer. So you can put it, when you catch, capture a swarm, you put the swarm in a hive. If you put a, the, a queen includer on the bottom of the hive between the bottom, bo the bottom of the box and the entry, then the workers can go in and out of the hive, but the queen can't, nor can drones. So you don't leave it there for about a day. But it makes the swarm acclimate to the hive faster if you do that, if you put a queen it on as a queen includer. Another use for the queen excluder is to uh, drain cut comb honey. It, the spaces between the slats between the little the area in here is, are just perfectly spaced so that you can put uh, cut comb honey on it and it doesn't make indentations in the cut comb honey, honey, which is just great. And another use for the queen excluder is if you want to make a split and you're really scared you take the, you'll take the queen by accident, then you go into the hive where you wanna make the split and you find frames of brood and eggs and pile in all the things you need for the split, find five frames and shake all the bees, every single bee off of them. Then put a queen excluder on top of the hive and put a new box on top of the hive with the five frames you've picked in the center and three empty frames on the outside and then cover the hive up and leave it until the next morning. And if you go early in the morning, you can take your split and the nurse bees, a plenty of nurse bees will come up to keep the babies warm. And you can take that as your split and you haven't got, you're for sure don't have the queen because she couldn't come through the queen excluder. But the worst part about this queen excluder is because I don't use them, I don't think about them. And here's this hive that we had for winter and it went through the winter with the queen excluder on. And that is a huge mistake because what bees do in the winter is they move up in the hive and cluster around the sources of honey until the end of winter when they've probably gotten to the end of their supply. But because this hive had a queen excluder on it the, and the queen goes with them. So the queen couldn't go with them to go up and cluster. So I don't know what the bees did. I don't know if they went up and took honey and came down and clustered with the queen or how they managed it, but they lived through the winter and they lived for seven years, those bees. But, um, but I was really upset to find that I'd left the queen and excluder on in that horrible forest. Speaking of the queen, one of the other uh, mistakes rookies make is panicking over the queen. Is she in the hive? And when you pull a hive of bees, I mean a frame out of a hive of bees, it just looks like a moving mass of bees. It just looks like all oh, these bees are just moving and moving. It's very hard to see the queen in the, if you've got a big thriving hive like that. So it's, and she's on that frame. I don't know if you all see her, but if you don't see her, here she is. She's that long body right there. But it is really hard and she didn't stand still. I saw the queen more frequently on my computer than I ever saw her in the beehive and I still see her more frequently on the computer than I ever see her on the in the beehive. But you don't need to panic. Let me go back and say, you don't need to panic if you don't see the queen. The only thing you have to see is proof that she exists. And the proof that she exists is if you see eggs and young brood, then you know she's been there in the last three days and so you can feel good about her existence. Another mistake rookies make is they see queen cells and think they should cut them because it will keep their hive from swarming. And no matter what people tell you, that, that's not a good idea to cut the queen cells. Now, you could take a queen cell if you see lots of them in the hive, you could take one of them out to make a split with it, which is not a bad idea. This is, by the way, a kind of cool frame because I don't use foundation and because I don't use foundation, the bees build their own wax however they want it. And see what they've done here is they've cut it, they've taken out the wax behind this queen cell to give it plenty of room to grow and be healthy and not get bumped and have it extend from the, uh, the middle of the frame. It's a great queen cell. Here's another one getting started right here too. 
Um, but I, I love that they all do that. But if you cut that queen cell, the day you cut all the queen cells is the day you create an emergency for yourself. And suddenly there's no queen cell and the bees have to make an emergency queen cell, which they will do sort of in the middle of the frame, find an, uh, an available egg and, and make it a queen. And if you've taken all their, their resources for that, you're going to end up with a queenless hive. Okay, this is not as big of an issue, but I wanted to show it just to help you all. This is what capped honey looks like. This is white wax. It's all pure wax over honey, and it's absolutely beautiful. But it's very hard sometimes for, for beginning beekeepers to see that this honey is honey, not brood. Brood is, also has wax cappings. The wax is mixed with some other materials that are in the hive waste and whatever they, and that's why it's kind of beige or brown, it's not white when they cap the brew, but it also is raised up a little bit. This is called wet capped honey. And the reason it's called wet capped is because the capping on the honey actually is sitting down on the wet honey. So the wet honey shows through and it makes it look um, brownish and different than the white wax that you expect honey to, to be. But when you find wet capped honey, one of the ways you can know that it's honey is that it's A, not raised like this over here, but also you'll usually see some uncapped honey on the same frame. Okay, another mistake that rookies can make very easily is to drop a frame. I've dropped so many frames. Once, I, because I use foundationless frames, if you're not very careful with a foundation frame, a foundationless frame, you have to hold it exactly up and down. If you hold it at a slant, there's a chance in the heat of summer that the entire wax will break off if they haven't hooked it on all four sides. And typically bees don't hook the brood frame on all four sides, they just hook it at the top. So I pulled a deep frame out that was only uh, attached to the frame at the top and held it at an angle. The, front, the whole entire deep honeycomb broke off and fell on my feet and the bees crawled up my legs, all the way up my legs and stung me in places I don't like to think about. It was really awful. And so you have to be really careful when you drop a frame. And this is my son-in-law, this is not my son-in-law, this is a friend, but my son-in-law took a, uh, the top cover off of a beehive that we had, and it was a thriving hive, so it was covered with bees. He picks up the inner cover as we're starting to open the hive, and he sees a black widow spider on the inner cover. And my son-in-law screamed and dropped the inner cover, and when he did, he laughed, he ran away, and the bees stung me. So that's who got stung. No, I did, it didn't look like this, but it sure felt like it. I got stung seven or eight times. Those bees were so mad, and he didn't get a single sting. It seemed very unfair to me. Another issue that you can run into is bad clothing, timing, and caffeine. Those are all important to the bees. So I did think this was kind of cute, though. There's this company in England that makes all different colors of bee suits. I don't think we have many in the United States that do that, although my daughter does have a bright blue bee, shirt, bee uh, jacket that she got from Dave Miller in South Carolina. But these bee jackets are just as cool as they can be. But most beekeepers wear white. And if you wear a color like black, then the bees think you're a bear and they want to come after you. And, um, and drinking caffeine, also not a good thing because the caffeine on your breath for some reason is not pleasing to bees. And then there's the timing of it all. When you go into a beehive, it's really important not to go do your hive inspection during orientation. And orientation flying is like between 4 and 5.30, somewhere in there. It happens every day. The bees are flying out for orientation. And it's a time when if you go to the beehive, you're asking for trouble. So early in my beekeeping, it might have been my very first year, I was singing in a church choir. And I had a, we had a choir workshop for the weekend. And I had on an all black, because we've been told that we were all black that day. So I had on all black. And I had been drinking Cokes all day to stay awake uh, for the um, rehearsals that we were doing because they were long and kind of tedious. And I don't drink Coke much, but I was drinking lots of Coke. Um, and it was 4.30 in the afternoon when they said, you can have a break. It's actually four o'clock. They said, you can have a break and go home. And then we'll all get back together at 5.30 for dinner. So I went home and I thought, oh, I'll go see my bees. So in my black outfit with caffeine on my breath and at 4.30, I went and sat down by my beehive on the ground and watched them. And one of them came over and stung me in the face. And at the time I was teaching at Emory and, I, and I, we were doing videotapes in which I was part of the videotape and I was in the video. So I told all the medical students I was working with that we could not film this side of my face, which swole, it was all swollen up. So I only filmed from the 
<laughs> one side of my face. Okay, another mistake that people make is harvesting too much honey in the first year or any year. It's really important to know that the honey that the bees are storing is their stockpile for the winter. They're not making honey for you. They're making honey for them so that they can live through the winter. And whatever we take should be surplus. It should be more than they need for winter is what we should take. And if we take more than that, then we have no choice except to feed the bees. And you also have no choice to, except to feed the bees. If you have a new hive that hadn't that got started kind of late, most people get their new bees right in the middle of the nectar flow. So the bees don't have the same opportunity as a hive that's overwintered and can start collecting nectar the minute the nectar flow starts. So, but if you have to feed your bees, it's also better if you feed them honey than sugar. I had a top bar hive that died this year and it, it had been around for seven years, so it's very sad, but it died this year and it left a full, a full hive full of honey. So I took all the honey and and it had been dead long enough without my noticing it that the honey wasn't as dry as it should be. Honey should be 18.6% moisture and the honey was wetter than that but I have a huge Tupperware container that's about this big and this deep filled with honey from that hive. And when I have to feed the bees this year, I'm gonna feed them that instead of uh, sugar syrup. Um, and you should only use sugar if absolutely necessary. And I don't ever use sugar syrup, I use BT. But if it's your first year of beekeeping and you're dying to see what your honey tastes like, it is not gonna hurt your hive to take one frame and harvest that so that you can get a taste of your honey for the year. Now, another bee, uh, mistake bees, keepers make, new beekeepers make, is by killing your bees without understanding how to put your hives back together. There's a, there was a beekeeper in Arizona named Dee Lusby, and she, I saw her at a conference in Massachusetts, and she literally picks up the hive box and drops it on the ground, and I just, she's a great big woman, and she's a little intimidating, and I was a little scared too, but I wouldn't do that to my bees. So what you do with your bees is you put them, when you take your hive apart to do an inspection, when you put it back together, there are two ways to do it that you can take care of your bees. One of them is called the bulldozer method. So on that one, if this red box is the original hive and the blue box is the box that you take off, you slide the box gently forward. And like a bulldozer, the box will push the bees that are sitting on the edges out of the way. And, and you'll kill a bee or two at the front edge, but you won't kill a whole bunch of bees when you do it that way. And another way is called the carousel method. I like this because the carousel is the only thing I ever want to ride at Six Flags. On this one, you set the body, the box down catty corner like this. And then in the same way, you gently slide it in a circle. Oops, you slide it in a circle and that circle will put the, will also get the bees on the corners to move out of the way. Um, and so that allows them to get out of the way and not die too. Now, another thing that happens with new beekeepers is they get confused about what is orientation and what is robbing because orientation happens every afternoon. It looks a little frantic and all orientation is is the bees learning where home is. It is not robbing. So I have a little video that we're going to look at of what orientation looks like. This is orientation. It looks very frantic and sometimes people get it confused with robbing. It happens around 4.30 every afternoon, sometime between four and five. Um, and what's happening is the bees are trying to figure out where home is so that they can go out foraging and know how to get back. And it always looks just this frantic. I'm gonna go to the side so you can see what they're doing. They're flying in and facing the hive to see where home is. What does it look like? These are new bees that haven't flown before and they're trying to get oriented so that tomorrow they can be foragers and they'll be able to get there, get home. And since new bees emerge every day, this goes on every day. See how frantic it looks? And it looks so frantic that many times new beekeepers think that this is robbing. This is not robbing. This is called orientation fly. And they walk around the hive and see if the picture is any better from the other side of how frantic it is. So you can see the bees looking at the hive. They're trying to see what does it look like so they can find it tomorrow. You can see they fly out and they kind of circle around and come back. Okay, very better. So that's what orientation looks like. Now, oops, I need to go to the next slide. This is what robbing looks like. This is what robbing looks like.
the bees are fighting with each other. You can see clumps of bees driving to the ground. I have the whole hive closed up. I've put a hive screen on and blocked the entrance. The bees that are resident can enter at uh, one top little opening in the in the hive, but most of the robber bees are flummoxed as to how to enter the hive. The attacks are happening nonetheless. You can see clumps of bees fall into the ground. Isn't that horrifying? From this angle, you can see that at the very top of the robber screen, right there is a way for resident bees to go in. I can close that off. I may need to. The theory with the robber screen is that the, the resident bees are drawn by the pheromone of the queen and the robbers go for the entrance. And the violence just horrifying. That's my hive in my backyard. Rain would help right now. It feels a little bit like it might rain in a little bit. I may go get a wet sheet though and put over the hive. Usually when Robin is that advanced, there's nothing you can do. And the, this hive died and it was one of the strongest hives I've ever had. I was just so sad about it. And you can do lots of things. You can turn your sprinkler on and make them think it's raining. You can put a wet sheet over it. But the best thing to do is to preventively have robber screens on your hives. Oops. Um, Billy Davis taught me again about how to use robber screens. And a robber screen is a piece of number eight hardware cloth. And I keep entrance reducers on my hives all the time. And he said that the, uh, in, the entrance of the robber screen needs to be four inches from the edge of the entrance to the hive. And if you do that, then you will keep robbing from happening. And I haven't had any robbing. That robber, robbery that I filmed was the last horrible robbery I've had. I haven't had any robbery since then. Ever since then, I've used robber screens on my hives all year long. And that way, they are there. And they get stapled. You staple them with the staple gun across here and across down here. And the bees learn to enter on the side. But when you first do it, the bees are very confused. They come and they hang out and they get kind of mad and they fly into the hive and they can't figure out how to get there. But after a while, they learn that they need to come around to the side. I have seen them, though, actually pass nectar through the number eight hardware cloth, you know, with their tongue, which has a, a it's a proboscis and has a tube. They can pass the nectar to their sisters on the other side of the robber screen until they figure it out. So the key to, to avoiding mistakes as a rookie is just to learn from your mistakes, to do the best you can to figure out every beekeeper, every experienced beekeeper has made more mistakes than you can count. And I certainly am among them. And every mistake gives you an opportunity to think it through differently for the next time and to learn something new. The internet is a great resource for figuring out ways to handle your mistakes. And if you wanna see lots and lots of mistakes, visit my blog, beekeeperlinda.com. All I do is write about all the things I've done wrong so you can see lots of them. And thank you for your attention today. I have enjoyed being with you and uh, I hope you've gotten something from this.